good? Ben Tech Team. I'm Kate, I'm on the behavioral science team. Cool. I'm the other Holly, I'm on the behavioral science team. Uh, right, two Hollies. <laughs> there was a stipulation somewhere that we would not. I was going to remember everybody's uh, name. Now it's going to be totally gone. Yeah. I'm just going to right, call everyone Holly. Right. <laughs> Is there another Holly here by any chance? I'm hitting a Holly. All right. I'm Devin. I'm on the tech team. I'm Jocelyn. I'm on the design team. Jocelyn? Mm -hmm. Cool. I'm Ian. Ian. On the design team. Okay. Uh, Matthias. Data manager. Okay. I was shooting from technical group. Technical group. Cool. And I'm on the little pilot team. Cool. Shannon, you're on the science team? I'm Holly. I'm on the team. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Resident comedian. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm just going to call everyone Holly now. And this is Amy. Hi everyone. Project Engagement Team. And I'm Andy. I'm from the Project Engagement Team also. And my name is Marcel Mango. I'm the director of the Project Engagement Team. And um, we wanted to give you a little... Oh, you are awesome. We wanted to give you a little primer. We're calling it the Michigan Agile Philosophy because if you don't have your own name, then you're nothing, right? And so we wanted to... So we were tempted to make it into an acronym, but it's a map. Yeah, it's, it's, it's how we get from one point to another. So we're going to give you a, a, a quick primer, which won't be quick, but uh, we're going to do it anyway. So just to set the tone, Andy and I have not rehearsed this. This is the first time we're giving this. We've given little... Together. Yeah, together. <laughs> We've given informal talks before, um, but we're not much for PowerPoint, and we're not much for presenting, so we'd love to have discussion as it, as it comes up. So. Um, we're going to be tag teaming at impromptu times. Whenever the the mood hits him right, he'll probably push me out of the way and, and correct me, and I'll try to do the same. So, um, you hearing everything okay, Ian? You good? Okay. I think so. Cool. All right. So I'm going to start and let uh, let Andy give you a little bit about traditional project management. Yeah. So one of the things we want to talk about is why we do what we do and why we don't do what we don't do. Um, and so, you know, with traditional project management, you have distinct phases that you work until completion before you start the next one. Now, everybody does it a little bit different. Um, sometimes there is some overlap, but generally speaking, you start with requirements, you take your requirements, you do your design. Once you've got your design complete, you start your implementation, then you turn it over to QA, they throw all the bugs back to the developers, they get them all fixed, and then uh, the user gets a look at it after that. Um, and so, uh, there's, you want me to advance down the slide? Um, so uh, the issue is that this creates a whole bunch of problems at every different phase. Now, of course, in any kind of project management style, you're going to have problems. But uh, let's talk about one. Um, in, in the case of verification and testing, this is actually going to be the first time that a user sees what they told you that they wanted. And oftentimes, what they tell you is, oh, when I said that, this is what I meant. And if only they could have seen it here, as opposed to waiting until the end. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this. This is a favorite of mine. It's been out for a really long time. Uh, but these are the different ways that we get to end results. So how the customer explained it, uh, they want this really funky swing. Um, the project leader understood it as something you can't actually even swing on. Uh, the analyst designed it as something that you could swing on at your own peril. Uh, uh, a programmer wrote it so that it doesn't actually swing. And this is not intended to be an insult to programmers. It's just how they interpreted what the uh, customer explained. Um, the business consultant wanted, consultant wanted a recliner on a swing. Um, this is going to be the best swing ever. And so you can see how we get these different interpretations. Language is a really powerful thing and it's a really dangerous thing. Think about how uh, you can say the same sentence and put the um, pronunciation on a different word in that sentence and that sentence can mean something different altogether. Yeah, our favorite one of that, and we have this, one of our, our tenants in the group is let's eat grandpa. So if it's let's eat comma grandpa, it's different than let's eat grandpa, right? So let's eat grandpa. 
Uh, so this is actually taken from a photo. It's a sign somewhere. Uh, you and I have no idea what it means, nor does the person trying to read it. And oftentimes, this is what we're uh, working with when we look at a requirements document. What, what does this mean? And we, we go back maybe to the business analyst or to whoever collected the requirement from the customer, and what we get from them is their translation of what they think the customer meant. But it's like the telephone game. That's actually one person removed from the customer. Um, and they probably took that requirement days, weeks, most likely months ago. So it happened quite a while ago in our cycle. The other key thing here is there's a whole bunch of stuff. When I tell you um, that I had breakfast this morning, um, since we're on the theme of eating, uh, that's very generic. But there's a lot of things that go into that. I might have prepared the best omelet I've ever eaten. I might have had steak and potatoes for breakfast or steak and eggs. Um, or I might have just had a simple granola bar or banana. Um, but just eating breakfast this morning doesn't really tell you a lot about what I did. Uh, oftentimes users are the same thing. If you, if you ask a user how they do something, they, uh, and we have a whole bunch of behavioral people in the room, so they probably know this uh, very well, but uh, they're gonna tell you something that only begins to scratch on the surface. Um, and end users are not technologists, they're not systems thinkers. So when they say, I need it to do this, they don't have a grasp or a handle on what that looks like once they receive the system and actually have to start working with it. They have no idea what it's going to look like on the screen, what they tell you that they think that they need. And so there's a lot of stuff below the surface. Um, the other thing that we get is we get a high cost of change. This is actually from the Apollo 13. There was a breakdown in their uh, air filter, right? And so they had to, to scramble together and, and make something work. Um, and had they built this in, it probably would have been a really expensive um, filtration system, but they, they, they did something that ultimately if they hadn't made that change, it would have cost them their lives, right? No clean air um, to breathe. And so if you think about, um, we wrote the requirements and we spent a whole bunch of money to write the requirements. Then we did the design and we, we spent a whole bunch of money doing the design and the mock-ups. And then we wrote it and then we tested it and then we gave it over to the customer and the customer said, well, that's not what I meant. I actually meant this. Think about all that stuff that you did along the way to do that thing and how much money you invested in it to get to the point where it was actually just the wrong thing. Now you might be 80% right, you might be 60% right, so it's not maybe necessarily all a loss, but think about how if you could bring that back up to the front end of your process, how much you could save uh, by not um, waiting so long, by not having distinct phases. Um, along those lines, uh, undelivered requirements become waste in the system. So we think about, well, how do we deliver projects on time? Oftentimes we cut scope. Um, sometimes we uh, shortcut. We, we, we say, well, let's sacrifice on quality. Um, we said we were going to do something really nice here, and we're just going to do a sliver of what we said. Uh, again, think back to those cycles. I took the time to collect that full requirement as an analyst. Um, I took the time to design exactly how that would work from end to end. And now all of a sudden it gets to a developer. Sorry. Thought I closed everything that I didn't need to see. Um, and uh, so we spent money to do this work. It's real. It's real work, but it never actually sees the light of day. And so if we could avoid it, that have avoided that, we'll save money. So let me give you a practical example. Um, this is a project for an inpatient mobile app. Um, the initial project cost was a million bucks. So we looked at it and we collected some high level requirements and we said, okay, that's going to cost about a million dollars to build. Um, the size of it is 500 story points. We'll talk about that later. Um, estimated velocity about 50 story points a month. Again, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and so we think we can get this thing built in 10 months. And we think that it'll take about, or it'll make about 200,000 per month. So if we look at that from start, to delivery, and again, if we're estimating this up front, uh, you know, good, good luck to us, but from start to delivery, 10 months, and then we begin to pay back when we deliver it, and we think at about 200,000 per month, we actually break even at 15 months. And so what we wanna do is now talk about, um, there's gotta be a better way than that, uh, a better way than all these missed requirements. What happens when you end up with a tattoo that's misspelled? And if we translate that into these projects, we just got it wrong. Um, and so we want to we talk to you a little bit about how we do it um, and how we think that it can be done a little bit better.
right, so this is one of my favorite quotes of all time. Uh, failure is not fatal, but failure to change might be. And if you think about projects, it's huge, right? Um, when you think about companies, it's huge. Um, when I think about the health system, I think about um, you know, how sometimes we hold on to the past for too long until the ship is kind of already, you know, kind of sunk. And um, it, it happens to lots of companies, right? And so um, we can't be afraid to change for the better. Um, and so John Wooden's a famous um, basketball coach. I think he's won more championships than anyone. All around good guy. All right, so what we want to talk to you about a little bit is Agile. Um, Agile's got tons of different meanings and terms, and that's why we branded our own the Michigan Agile philosophy. <laughs> um, so what we really want to do is we want to allow customers to change as they need to change. We don't want to necessarily make them sign a, a complete strict contract at the beginning and then hope that by you know a year when the project's over, they got everything perfectly at, at the beginning. Um, we want um, to eliminate this notion of drinking from the fire hose, right? How many people work lots of hours at points, right? Where you're just like, you know, 20 hour days, and it's like leveled off for a long time and then you get these spikes, right? Well, we want to kind of smooth that stuff out and help um, increase the, the quality of life while improving throughput, right? So we get more stuff done, we're happier because we don't have these big spikes. Um, um, we want to reduce emergencies so that Everything is in an emergency, um, and you know, support at the end is often uh, where we spend a lot of our time and our money, so we want to lessen that burden, and we believe strongly in communication over documentation. So communicating with key stakeholders, people on the team, things like that, and we'll go into more of that detail in a few. So years ago, a bunch of smart people got together and they wrote something they call the Agile Manifesto. And so what, what we have is, and the way you usually see this is two columns, and you see this column on the right and this column on the left. And what the manifesto basically says is we favor this stuff on the left over this stuff on the right. So um, we like individuals and interactions over process and tools. Now, it doesn't mean that the things on the right aren't important, but where there's a choice, we're kind of favoring this stuff on the left. Um, we also believe in working software over comprehensive documentation. That'll make sense to people. Documents never really, you know, they're good to have, but we prefer to have stuff that works. Um, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. The trust between the customer and, and you and the team is really critical for us. Um, and then responding to change versus following the plan. Um, a plan is only as good as first contact with the enemy, we used to say in the Army, and that's pretty true. You you'd sit down, you write out a plan, and then you go out, and all of a sudden, they're not where you planned that they were going to be, right? And that's the same way a project works. You, you, uh, you know, you may plan, but the plan is just a constantly evolving thing. So people talk about planning is a good thing, but plans usually don't last very long. So we've come up with. Do you have a question? Or no. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry. No, 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 no. I'll also pick up. Yeah, you know, someone's scratching their nose. I'll call it too. Um, so we've come up with what we call our waypoints or our pillars, and, and really there's four main headings that we talk about when we talk about our philosophy. So the first one is team, and then we'll go into the work, we'll talk about touch points, and then continuous improvement. So the team, and I was able to come up with some <laughs> sitcom stuff because you guys are all down with the team stuff. Um, so it's all about the team. It, it, the team is really critical to, to making Agile work. Um, so what does a team look like? Um, well, it's the doers, which means the developers, the analysts, all, all, the, all the people that are doing the work. Um, it's a process owner, typically your scrum master or your PM, so they're managing the, the team through the process. And then what we call the product owner. And the product owner is the person that's going to help us um, all along the, the project. They're going to help prioritize things for us. They're going to help us change direction. They're going to be watching to make sure that we're doing the right pieces of work. Um, so along with this, we believe that the best thing is to have teams that are co-located and cross-functional. So teams actually sitting together is really critical because when you're sitting with your team, it's really easy to just say, hey Joe, or hey Holly, um, how do we do this, or how do we do this, or um, I have a question about this, do you know the answer to that? It saves us on meetings, it helps us collaborate, it helps us share information, and the whole team tends to grow. Um, 
cross-functional. We like having art people, we like having behavioral scientists, we like having developers, we like having people, diverse uh, skill sets on the team. We find that projects run smoother, we get the best uh, innovation on the team. Um, we also believe strongly in the team being able to self-organize. Uh, we empower our teams. So what that means is that people get to choose the work, the, the stories, the bits that they work on, um, and the team can, can figure, they'll just figure it out. A lot of smart people together in a room tend to be able to work out solutions better than you know, someone on high saying, this is how we're going to do it, this is how we're going to do it. Um, so really empowering the team to make decisions that are going to help them get the project done is, is important. Um, so pairing, isn't that a cute picture? Um, so pairing is, is something that you hear about in this methodology called extreme programming. And pairing on the software development side is a fantastic thing. If you've never tried it, it's really great. Two sets of eyes on something usually help build up the other person. Usually one person's better than the other and some of the, the goodness rubs off on the person that's maybe less good. Um, you tend to have less defects in code because you got two people watching it. Um, you tend to make better decisions. Um, pairing isn't something that we completely do, um, so I'll, I'll just be honest there. We tend to pair when needed. Um, I was uh, helping a team this morning even and one of the guys was saying, hey, I'm, I'm struggling with this, would you mind pairing with me for the day? So the two of the guys are going to get together and they're going to pair and work out um, some software development issues that they have. So it's not a requirement in our philosophy, it's encouraged where possible, um, but uh, I think people get nervous about having to sit next to another person and I know the first time I paired it was a little bit of that because I was paired with a guy that was way better a developer than I was and so I was a little freaked out, but after a while it became just the thing that we were going to do every day. And um, different people would drive the keyboard on different days, and it, it just kind of worked out. We got comfortable after a while. So, And I got way more productive. So, All right, pillar number two, the work itself. It's kind of a, a big category here. MacGyver, right? Everyone knows MacGyver. No, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. um, so one of the first steps um, in any transformation that we've done is uh, to making the work is making the work visible. So um, we do that in a bunch of different ways. Um, one way is by using what we call an information radiator. So this is a, a board in Jira, and this is showing one team all the work that this one team is doing. And we have it in these different categories, and we have a, a workflow set up for this particular team. Yours doesn't have to look like this, but we have a to-do column. This is all the work that needs to be done. Um, we have stuff that the team is working on. We have stuff that the team has completed and is ready for QA. And QA goes into this business verification um, bucket and then it gets moved to done. So the, the beautiful thing about this is at any time I can tell you what any person on my team is working on. Um, and if I click on one of these, it gives me more, more information about it. But radiating whatever information you, that makes sense for the team is really nice. It could be a card wall. That's how we started with a lot of this. With index cards, you paste it on a wall, you put up kind of a workflow similar to this, and at any time the team could walk up to the card wall, look at where, where things were in, in process. Uh, and more importantly, the, the product owner could see where, where his project is, what, what the status is. And it's important to think about how much of a difference this makes. Um, so just a couple quick stories on that. The first is I started working with a team that was responsible for maintaining a whole set of applications. And so that was pretty much all that they did. So when I joined this team, I had all these grand ideas, right? Knowing nothing about the work that they were doing, all these grand ideas about how we could make their world better. Um, until I actually started sitting with them and working with them. And I was like, wow, you guys really are just overwhelmed with the amount of stuff that you had to do. But one of the things that we did was we set up a card wall just like this. This is actually from uh, Jira, from Atlassian. Um, and we made everybody work on something uh, that was a story. And by made, it's not that demonstrative, but really that was the philosophy of the team. Is if you're working on something, it's gotta be in here. And what we actually found was the team had 25% capacity for new work. And the biggest reason for that is because the work that was being assigned to them was coming out of someone's head, essentially. Um, it's just, okay, what's the next thing that needs to be done? And they were thinking, because they had so much to support, the person that was responsible for coordinating it was thinking about so many different things in so many different ways, talking to so many different customers that they really just, 
uh, I don't know, go, go pick up you know, this next support thing uh, because that's the thing that's already there and it's ready to be thought about versus getting out ahead of it. So by getting everything into one place and really thinking about what is the work that's remaining to be done, this is what we call a backlog, um, what is in there, and hopefully it's in prioritized order. Now since somebody actually doesn't have to think for somebody else to get some work done, it's already been thought about and it's already there. It helps everybody coordinate because it helps us look at where things are in our queue to figure out do we need to get more work ready for the team? Uh, is the team full uh, and at capacity? Another thing that's really interesting is it doesn't just have to be about the work. So for example, we had uh, one team um, somewhere that I was at where they had trouble with their product owner. The product owner was never in the room. They were, so this was a, a company that sold uh, an application and their product owner was constantly with sales, marketing, customers, whatever. But the team always found that they were backlogged in decision making because they, they needed to ask a question of the product owner. So they raised this issue and raised this issue and raised this issue in some of the various um, touch points that we'll talk about and nothing changed. And so what they actually did was they put up a big visible chart, a calendar, and every day of the calendar, if the product owner came into the team room, they would put a smiley face. And if the product owner did not come into the team room, they would put a frowny face. And what they found happened was uh, within a week, they had five or six people that were not the product owner, but people of influence that came in and asked, what's that chart for? What do you, you know, why are you guys so unhappy? Uh, and essentially what they said is, the person that we need to make decisions is not available to us. And so they made the necessary change. Um, now that outcome was a positive outcome. Sometimes they're not always positive outcomes, but what we need to happen is we need uh, information to be visible so that we can have decisions to be made. And oftentimes just telling people information, even sometimes over and over and over, doesn't necessarily get the outcome that, that uh, you desire. So by making information big and visible, um, sometimes it's in a positive way. It's not, it's, you know, the product owner example is a, an example where a team had an issue, but sometimes it's celebrating everything that we got done this month, all the systems that we released. Look at how much work we've accomplished. Um, different ways of rating, radiating information to the groups around you are really, really valuable. One of the most and one of the ways that we start is the work that, excuse me, that the team is doing. Sure. So does this show dependencies, like if you're waiting for somebody to do something or you're waiting for a product owner to give you some information? Uh, yes and no. Um, so yes, in the case of um, some teams, so for example, business verification, you would have a product owner say that this meets the requirements that were in the story. Uh, we actually have work in progress limits, so we can only have so many things in this, in this column before the column turns red. Uh, and so what I would know then is I have an issue that needs to be addressed. What we don't do, what we try not to do, um, and, and one of the things that you'll find with us is uh, the answer a lot of times is going to be it depends because so much of the way in which we work is contextual and there's so many opportunities to adapt it. So you will get people who say this is the right way. Um, oftentimes the right way depends on circumstances, but uh, where possible the idea for any uh, story, and again we'll talk about stories specifically, is that it is a complete unit of work. So what you want is small individual uh, units of work that are able to be completed all the way through the process without dependency. So in the case that you gave like the product owner, hopefully we can highlight that there's a bottleneck in our system and that's getting things approved by the product owner. But hopefully this story isn't waiting on this story wherever possible. So, um, now obviously there are some times where that's gonna be the case so you would prioritize accordingly. I know I can't do this one until this one is done. So that's just gonna be a lower priority. Maybe there's a note in that story. But the idea is few, few dependencies as few as possible. Yeah, so that's how we do, we have, you know, we, the team I'm working with right now does a lot of website work. And so there are times when it's, you know, design art for this site, and then there's a story that talks about actually placing the story or the, the art into the, into the site. So if, if the, uh, the art one is up here, chances are we can't even plan the other one yet until we know that the art one's gonna be done. So we prioritize this stuff. That helps with some of the dependency stuff. But like Andy said, you like to make these stories, and you like to write the chunks of work so that there are as few dependencies as possible. Now, the way we radiate information is we have a cart. We have we teams sitting in little pods together. We have a cart with a big screen on it that always has information kind of cycling. So um, this is one of the things that typically cycles, usually how many days are left in our iteration, which we'll go over, things like that. Um, the team I'm working with right now, I've been working with them about 10 weeks now. And um, at about week five or six, I started finally really understanding what the team is rated on, what, what they need to be doing, things like that. And so 
I started crunching some numbers with Amy and we were figuring out, this is the, the, within MSIS, this is one of the only teams that is a recharge team. And so they need to make certain numbers. They need to be billable 60% of the time or whatever it is. And um, so we started crunching numbers. We found out it was a lot lower than that. We said, okay, well, we need to make sure we're radiating this information. So we started showing the team how, you know, how billable they really were. Now, they were all very busy, but a lot of the work they were doing wasn't billable stuff. So once we started showing them, it's gone you know, through the roof. So now they're thinking about it and they're acting on it. So radiating information is a really important thing for us to think about. And this may not be the thing you radiate, it may be other things. We have a whole list of things that we believe are important that we can share as, as we kind of go forward. So one of our other um, kind of mantras is to minimize work in progress. So you hear, you hear, you'll hear us say with, um, is it with it good? Uh, <laughs> no, no, I got it. No, 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 okay, thank you. All right, so work, minimizing work in progress is this. And I'll show you a really bad example of of minimizing work in progress. Each one of these icons represents a different person. And so when we say minimizing work in progress, I can only physically work on one thing at a time. Um, and our brains, when they're thinking about multiple things at a time, they deteriorate pretty quickly. We're, humans are not really good at multitasking. So we try to keep people focused on just doing one thing at a time. This is another experiment we've done on this team. We've asked people to, to focus on one thing at a time, and every week they say, gosh, we've got way more done. It doesn't seem like it. It may be counterintuitive because I'm not juggling a million things, but when I focus on one thing and move it through the system, we tend to do a little better. So in this case, we got you know, three in progress, which is bad. Um, I think there's another example. So two here in progress, and then the good thing is that typically these are the two places where we really put limits in place, and thankfully nothing is being QA here. Another bad example would be is if, if this space was here and it was here, that means he's working on two things at one time. Um, again, we try to minimize that. Sometimes it's not perfect, like we have a lot of art people and video people, and sometimes it takes a while to render a project, and while something is rendering, maybe they could be doing something else, but in general, we're just not very good at multitasking as humans. And there's, uh, I've been doing a lot of studying and research and our behavioral people could probably help with this too, but when you don't complete something, your brain keeps working on it. So even though I'm doing something else, it's still working on the other thing that I didn't complete. So there's studies that say, when you get it done, that's when like the memory gets released for you, you know? So kind of a computer parallel. Um, we believe in iterations and this picture um, is supposed to show that we do these quick, speedy, mighty, short iterations. <laughs> uh, and, and basically an iteration is just an amount of time. Um, we tend to do, and we call them sprints as well, so iteration or sprint, we do one week iterations. So that means we plan our work, we go through the week, we deliver that work. So the beautiful thing there is we get these real short feedback loops and when we talk about these touch points you'll see a little bit more about why we think that's important. Uh, but for now, iteration sprints, for us it's a week. When I first started doing Agile stuff, it was a month. Found out that that was too long. I always tell a story about how I built something for some soldiers and they laughed at me at the end and then I was like, what, what, this is awesome. And they put their gloves on and they said, oh, I can't touch this. Thing. Okay, well, I'm glad I caught it after a month instead of what the typical military project is, seven years or whatever. All right, so, User stories, um, you saw some examples of them on that board. Um, a user story is just a chunk of work. And um, there's a special format we use for it. Um, we, we tend to say, as a blank, I want blank, so that blank. So in this, uh, in this case, it's as a game player, I want my rocket to move back and forth when I press left and right arrows so that I can avoid asteroids. Now why do we write it like this? Um, for me, it means lots of different things. Um, at, in the beginning, as a blank, it helps me understand the persona of the person that is going to be using this. Now I worked for a digital media agency for a while, we did personas on everything. So if you're doing a Facebook app, we did personas. Who are the people that are gonna use it so we can cater the thing to the, the right group? It turns out a 13-year-old girl thinks a lot differently than a 45-year-old PhD, okay? So we want to cater the applications to the, the people that are 
and we're delivering them to games the same way, websites, all this stuff. Um, and so when we're doing applications, it's nice to know the persona of the person that, that you're, you're doing it for, the, the person that's going to be using the system. Then we have this I want part, which explains from the user stand standpoint what, what they need from the system. And then the, so that part is kind of the payoff pitch, right? So that they can do, do something. Anything to add on that part? Um, so here's a couple examples, not particularly good ones, but they're examples from just card walls that people wrote. You know, as a doctor, I want to have a list of most common ICD-10 conditions. It should be so that, you know, so we're missing some parts there. Um, as a librarian, I want to be able to search for books by publication year. Pretty good, but it's still missing a chunk. And honestly, we're not complete agilistas with getting you know, all three parts right. If you can get them, it's great. But the most important thing is that the stories are clear, that people understand what the story what the story is. I'm a big fan of adding something in our stories that we call the acceptance criteria, which is the thing that um, basically you're going to show the product owner at the end in another one of these touch points that we'll, we'll share. Um, basically letting us know what this thing is going to do, but, you know, we're all about adapting to the particular team we're working with. So, all right. So, one of our favorite little sections here: estimating. Um, so, when we estimate projects now, a lot of people will estimate in hours, right? And so, I know when my wife says, "How long is it going to take you to fix that sink?" I kind of get a little bit freaked out, right? Because number one, I'm not a plumber. Number two, I'm not very handy. Uh, number three. She just freaks me out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so but what happens is I start thinking, okay, well, if this is really easy and I can just use the plunger a few times, it's a few seconds. But from experience, I kind of know that something bad is going to happen. It's going to be six trips to the hardware store. So eight hours it's going to take me to fix this clock, right? So I just kind of whip out a number, um, and it turns out the whole physiological response. For me, it is, I'm nervous now because someone's going to hold me to a number that I don't really, I don't completely understand what the project is yet. Um, and so it's not a good thing. Our estimations tend to make people uncomfortable. But the other part of the human that's a really interesting part of our condition is that if I say it's eight hours, or that's my guess, it tends to take me eight hours. Right? We'll fill up that time, so I'll play guitar for a little while. I'm like, I got eight hours. <laughs> you know? yeah. I'll mess around doing a whole bunch of other stuff, and then, you know, Seven hours and 59 minutes, I'll, you know, have the last group, or more likely, it'll be hour 12 or hour 13 or, you know, something like that. So, um, so we talk about something, an abstract term that we call story points. And it's just a fast way of estimating story. It turns out it's about as accurate as just using hours, and it takes a lot less time. So we can do something really quickly. Um, if, if I ask you to do something, and I ask Holly to do something, and I ask Holly to do something, and I ask, you're probably all going to come up with different hours, but when we talk about story points, you'll see that it'll average out around the team a lot, a lot better. Um, and again, there are tons of studies that talk about this relative estimation being more accurate or as accurate as absolute estimation at a lot less time. Um, and so, and when we do this estimating, we do it as a team, typically. Um, and the beautiful thing about that, you will see in a second. We're going to do a little exercise. Okay, so typically I would have cards that I'd pass out with little numbers and stuff on it, but since we all have hands, uh, please, did I not pick a group that doesn't have hands? <laughs> be my luck, right? A whole group of people without hands. Um, so what we want to do is we're going to talk about story points, and I'll give you four of them. I'm going to give you a half a point. Half a point is going to be your pinky, and it basically means anything from a couple minutes to maybe half a day. Um, we're going to say a one is somewhere around a day we're thinking. Uh, a two is two to three days, and a three is three to five days. Okay, you got it? Pinky's half a day, one day. Are you writing it down? No. <laughs> <laughs> you can write it down. It's okay. Half, one day, two to three days. Three to five days. Think of it also as extra small, small, medium, and large. There you go. Okay, so what we're going to do is everyone play paper, scissors, rock before. So it's like one, two, three, shoot. Okay. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about washing windows, and this is what we call planning poker or group, estima group estimation. And so the chore is washing windows. So we're going to do paper, scissors, rock, and at the end you're going to do one, two, three, four, half. Okay? So ready? ready. Everybody ready? Everybody's Everybody doing ready? it? I feel like Everybody's doing this, right? Yeah. Well, we've got their number in mind. How many, How many windows? How many windows? <laughs> <laughs> you want so the good. details? Yeah, good question. <laughs> so, this Decide. is part of the process. Let's, let's, uh, we'll estimate and then we'll, we'll talk about so, it. So, th so think about it in terms of doing some, some piece of work, right? We, we all have windows. Uh, whether or not somebody else owns our windows or we own our windows, we all have windows. So we contextualize the work that we do. I've seen it before and I've worked on it, so I think I know how big it is. I've never seen it before, I've never worked on it, so I think it's really big. And oftentimes we don't necessarily have those conversations. So we contextualize when we estimate, right? I think I know how long it's gonna to take to wash my windows, and so that's the estimate that I'm gonna take. Okay? Ready? Ready? One, two, three, shoot. Okay, hold up, keep your numbers out. All right. <laughs> You can tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, you're just Baby, Baby and we just, this is really good. So or they we live have, in a tent. <laughs> we have all the way from a half to, to a three. So what I typically do in this group is say, okay, so why did you say half? What, me? <laughs> yeah. You don't want to do this Because uh, <laughs> that's, I mean, because you just do it. It's boom, bam, done. I don't know. Okay. All right. So, so, so in, you, in your, it. yeah, so maybe. <laughs> I, probably because I don't care that my windows are as clean as Kate cares that her <laughs> <laughs> So that, that's important. Um, that's some good questions were asked early on, right? How many windows, how big is the house? That's important for a team to maybe discuss ahead of time, right? Um, who had, Andy had a three, why did you have a three? So my windows are really dirty. I have a lot of windows and I actually have, there's a walkout, so I have third story, so I'd have to like pull my car and then put a ladder on top of my car and then put a box on top of my ladder and be really careful and do it really slowly. So uh, it would take me a really long time to get my windows washed. So, so when we do this exercise, um, what we do is if, if everyone said one, then it's like, oh, great, it's a one, right? So we'd write that on the story card or write it in the story and say that's what the estimate is. But the beautiful thing, remember we talked about we stress communication? That's what we were just able to do, right? Because of the stupid planning poker thing, we were able to talk about the story a little bit more. And what's beautiful is I, c I could say, oh, Andy, don't worry about it. You don't need to pull your car in. I have a harness that you can strap to your house and it'll make it easy. Or I have a big pole with a, a thing on it. That's what tends to happen in software development, too, is that someone would say, um, you know, I got to write this uh, front end auth authentication system or something like that. And they'll say, oh, that's a three. That's, I've never done this before. This is crazy. Someone else will say, you know what? I have a library. All you got to do is plug the thing in and it'll just work, right? So getting the group together to discuss this stuff is absolutely wonderful. It, it, it will, you'll share knowledge, it, it will improve. Um, let's do uh, let's do another. Make the bed. Ready? One, two, three, shoot. Okay. We got all pinkies, right? So this is great. Almost, almost. We had a little bit. So, so I used to say if people had as many pillows to put on their bed they, as I do, for some reason, like they're organized a certain way. It's more like a three, but um, so yeah. So we all got it. So I would just. You know, write that down. But whenever there's disparity, it's a really good, good time for us to have a little discussion. And the discussion doesn't have to be long. It could be a real quick thing that just says, "Hey, I have some code," or "I've done this before." You know, it's it's really simpler, or whatever. A couple things to think about too is when we're doing this estimating and thinking specifically about implementing software, is we don't talk about actual implementation. Right? That's what happens when you pick up the work to do it. So one software development person, one behavioral uh, person is gonna do their work, come by their information a little bit differently than another person, and that might be very much okay. Uh, you might even, uh, once you do it, you might talk to other people about how they would do it. How would, how would you write this? How would you do this? Um, that maybe comes back to pairing, but what you don't wanna do there is talk implementation, because then essentially you're writing requirements for a story that you may not pick up, you may never play, depending on what your product owner decides, and so you don't want to build in cost into that estimating session. The other thing that's really interesting that you'll see is the longer that a team has worked together and the longer that they've worked on the same thing, the more likely they are to either estimate similarly 
or to very quickly arrive at a reasonable shared uh, story point value for that thing. So in other words, you get to uh, that half a point and three difference, and you'll have a 10 minute conversation with the team the first time you do the exercise. What about this? What about this? There will be debate. Once the team has worked together for a while, even in that kind of disparity, the biggest possible disparity that we can have, you'll get a team member that says, oh, well, you know, here's some information, some good information, and because everybody has that kind of that shared understanding of the system, all of a sudden there maybe is a realization or there's trust in the team. Okay, maybe it's not that big. I'll trust you now because we've built up this trust as a team. So we'll put that lower estimate on it and I'll trust that I'll get help when it comes to that, um, or self-organization, right? I'll trust that somebody who knows about it is gonna be able to pick it up um, and then I can maybe learn from them, them as they do it. And so that's why it's kind of this, we, you'll see a lot of these themes, right? That's why it depends so much on team. That's why it depends so much on having the right people at the table um, answering these questions and getting to this so that uh, we can actually do this work because think about the customer, right? So we've estimated a story. If we spend three hours estimating a single story that provides them a dollar's worth of value, think about how much we just, if we're charged back, charge them to get to that estimate. They received no value from our estimate. So that, that the estimating and the estimate for us is a way to get through that work to drive to customer value. And so the focus for us is really saying, how can we do the right things, but do them in a way that gets us quickly to providing customer value, because ultimately that's who the focus is for all of these things. All right, I'll spare you the other chores. You get the idea though? Everybody, everybody kind of get the feel for it? All right, so our, our third pillar, um, we're calling touch points. The, the name changes, but it still means the same thing. We have, I think we can we could call them meetings, but it's just, uh, well, what we want to say is that it's different, so you don't have as many meetings. Yeah, yeah. So there's a, a daily stand-up. Um, we call it our scrum meeting every day. It's typically five to 15 minutes long. Um, we force people to stand up around the board, around the, the kind of the project uh, board, and we go around the, the table, and uh, there's three questions. It's, what did you do? What did you work on yesterday? What story did you do? Um, what are you going to work on today? Which story are you going to work on today? And um, are there any impediments or any blockers? And that's it. So you just go through the whole team and you answer those three questions. Um, what's really nice is um, the team, number one, knows what you're working on, which is cool. But if there are any blockers or impediments, it's a real good opportunity where the team can say, I, got, I can help you with this. Let's talk about it afterward. Or they can maybe even share um, something quick during that meeting. So this is this is core. We everyone in MSI as we do this, we with our teams, and every day we do one of these meetings. Yeah, it's important too. So I've worked with mature teams who have said, oh, I want to get rid of we want to get rid of stand up, right? So we talk all the time. So we don't need to give people a status update. But what ends up happening is teams change. New people come in, people leave. Maybe somebody comes to you on loan because you're working on something that's difficult. Um, and just because that team identity identity has been formed by some group of people on the team doesn't mean that that identity isn't going to change or reform if the team takes on a new project even oftentimes that's going to be an opportunity to reform in a certain way as a team and so is there, there's some team dynamics that come into play for having a stand-up the other thing is um, that it, that format is important to get you started again oftentimes with communication changes really the stand-up is about how can we help each other out how can we get impediments out of our way how's our system working it's a temperature check for the team we had one uh, person on the team who uh, every day came in with the same story uh, for the entire duration and said, I should be done today. I should be done today. I should be done today. After the third day of saying that, he even said in stand-up, you know, I'm really tired of hearing myself say that I should be done today. <coughs> who wants to help me with this? Now, oftentimes, that's not going to happen, right? If I'm responsible to do something from start to finish, I'm going to work on it until it's done. But as soon as I have to tell other people that I'm working on this thing and I, it, it, it should be done today, I'm close, I hear myself say that, I'm gonna do something different about it, hopefully. Um, or if the team needs to, they can step in. So somebody with some expertise in that area can hear about it. Um, and so what you do is you get a team together talking about the things that they're working on and being vocal about them. You get the same benefit from a co-located space, but this is a specific time to stand up and have the team be accountable to each other, communicating with each other as a whole, um, and really talking about the work that they're doing and what they're trying to achieve that day. 
so the, the word Andy just said that I was, I was just going to bring up is the accountable word. When you have a team and you become accountable to each other, um, it's <coughs> both one of the most amazing things and it's kind of a scary thing. I remember one of, when I was a developer, I was on a team and I checked in bad code and yeah. I let my team down and it was, I felt horrible about it, right? So I worked harder to make sure that I didn't do that again. And that's, that's one of the things that the, the Scrum meeting helps to build the rapport among the team and um, you know, just that accountability with each other that, look, you said you were going to do this, I'm depending on you, so you know, let, let's work together. Sure. So how big is that team and how many projects are they working on? So we don't even have that. Okay. Do we have a slide about that? I thought so. Uh, hey, Mark. I'm not sure we do. When people ask a question, can I get you to sort of paraphrase, repeat it? Yeah. Sorry. So um, the question was, uh, how many projects are the teams working on at a time, and how many people are on the team? Um, so there are studies about team size, optimal team size. We think that it should be at least three, but no more than like eight or ten, something like that. There's kind of a sweet spot in there. Um, the ideal when you're talking about a team working on a project is that they're working on one project at a time. Um, There's another thing about that our slide was, uh, that relates to that is limit work in progress. So some of it is the actual work that's happening. I'm working on one thing now, but the other is working on one project at a time. Um, because again, if you think about all the things that Mark was saying about doing two things at once, working on two projects at once that may be totally unrelated to each other, all those same things apply as two stories. Uh, the other thing is, um, you get, when you leave one project and go to another one and then have to come back, you have to spend time ramping back up. What was I doing? Where was I? Uh, what did I need to touch? Recontextualizing yourself, even if it's a little bit. Think about each time you have to do that, a little bit of cost adds up. And who pays for that cost? The customer pays for that cost. And so ideally speaking, if we can limit, and again, ideally speaking, uh, if we can limit the teams to one project at a time and focus, Work goes faster. That project can be accomplished and moved off the plate, and then we can go on to the next project, accomplish it, and move it off the plate. Um, so I, I, I think that that's really key. One, one project at a time, wherever possible. Yeah, and, so, um, and then, sorry, team size. Two is not a team, uh, because if one person goes on vacation, uh, who do you estimate with? Um, and hopefully, if you're on a good cadence, you're doing the same activities every week, you're estimating stories in your backlog, you can't estimate, because that other person might pick up the work that you did. So that's why we say three. Once you get past nine, there's a certain level of coordination and communication and team dynamic that just changes uh, because of the size of the team. And so that's why we say, I think the actual, uh, so Scrum uh, is a term for a uh, agile project management or agile software development framework. Um, and Scrum says uh, six plus or minus two, I think, uh, is their kind of rule. So. Um, there's a lot of different philosophies, but yeah, we say basically three to nine. Three is enough of a, a three doers, by the way. Three doers, by the way. So uh, having a, a PM on a team with one person makes that person really miserable, uh, right? And uh, you know, having uh, having a team of uh, you know nine doers with a, with a product owner is is potentially a really valuable thing. So we would say not, we would say uh, three to nine. Uh, at least three doers, uh, probably about nine people or so, uh, with a couple more, but, but not too, not too many, too big, too much, too much communication, uh, too much lost information, too much time. Uh, it's, it's another thing that feels unintuitive to people. Uh, if, if I'm working on nine projects at a time, yeah, I'm, I'm cool. You know, I'm really cranking. But it turns out you're doing very little on each one of them. Yeah. We touched um, one of our teams that I'm trying to really get get on track with this. Um, two sprints ago, two iterations ago, we touched 30 different projects in one week. There's eight people on this team. And so if you start thinking about it, I think we got something like 35 points worth of work done. So if you start thinking about that, yeah, we got a whole point for each project done. Well, when there's you know two, 300 points for the whole project, get going one at a time, it's stretching everything. Uh, a friend of mine had the, the great analogy, it's like, Okay, there's a line of people at McDonald's and they want food. And so what the guy behind the counter says is, okay, I'm gonna take all your orders and he's gonna do bun, 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 right? You go down and then meat, 
me, 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 well, what's going to happen? Everyone's going to be pretty angry, I'm thinking. Whereas if he made a burger, he could give it to that person, and they'd go, yeah, thanks. And you know, the next person, or they, yeah, whatever they do. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's the idea, though, right? We want to make customers happy, and we can be predictive when we're doing one project at a time. When I have 30 projects going at the same time, I can't tell you when any of them are going to end. But with one, I can tell you. Because story points give us something called velocity. And velocity is about is the average amount of work that a team can do in an iteration. And so if I know that there are 500 points worth, and we're doing 10 points per week worth of work, I can calculate how long it's going to take us to get, get this thing done. So it's pretty helpful. Yeah, the, the one other thing that maybe we should have caveated at the beginning is you could, you could probably fill a library uh, in and of itself on all the things that have written about Agile. So there's two things, right? One, I said, is it depends, so so much is contextual. You're gonna read some stuff where people will say, absolutely, they, they back what, whatever it is that we said. There are other things where people uh, counteract it. You add all the blogs in the world, uh, you will get even that much more. Um, the other thing is, uh, on that then, there is a lot to be said. Um, and the idea here is that we're just kind of scratching the surface. So putting this stuff into to practice, um, trying it out, living it, um, there, there is a lot there, so uh, that's, that's why questions are so valuable because there's, I mean, we could spend all day together talking about uh, Agile and, and you don't want that because you don't want to listen to us all day, but, uh, but there is a lot to be said, and so think about those two caveats. Um, as you start to, to think about this stuff, pick up some stuff and read it um, and, and form opinions of your own because um, that's important too. You know your context even better than we do. You'll, you'll hear about different story point scales. Mm -hmm. You'll hear t-shirt sizing, small, medium, large, that kind of thing. You'll hear the half point, one, two, three. Yep. You'll hear Fibonacci series, one, two, three, five, eight, twelve, that kind of thing, um, which is what I had been using for a long time. And one of the beautiful things that we'll get to in a little while is that through this continuous improvement and just always adapting to new and changing, we're not afraid of change. Andy and I are big believers in failing fast, right? So it's, it's okay to fail, but let's just do it fast so that we can change and do something different. So um, so don't be afraid to try something, do little experiments. Um, the Fibonacci thing was confusing some people. The you know, 0.5, 1, 2, and 3, you know, people understand that scale better, so we switch to that. Okay, so the other touch point is um, once each iteration, we do something called planning and prioritization. Um, and that's where we take that backlog that you saw on that, that board and we prioritize all the work for the project or all the work for the 15 projects that we're doing. So we put the highest value stuff up at the top. Um, we make sure that each one of the stories is estimated and understood. And um, let's see, if there are new stories that need to be written, sometimes we'll write them there. Um, huh. We were going to use my computer, which I had completely tuned for the presentation, but it wasn't working so well. Um, and then, then we plan the next week, the next week of work, work based on what the velocity was or the average velocity for the team. So um, it's really one of the key uh, meetings. Um, when I first started uh, doing these things, we'd do them on Fridays. Um, it turns out in the summer, people are gone on Friday, so it makes it tough to have the whole team there. So. A lot of our teams are doing them in the middle of the week. You do yours on Mondays. Um, so it just depends. It's one of those things. We empower the team. The team makes the decision. You know, oftentimes you have the product owner that's difficult to get a hold of too, so sometimes it has to do with your schedule. Um, but this, this is kind of the cornerstone meeting, I would say, that we have during the week. Um, now, another important meeting that when I do these, typically they're kind of matched in with the planning and prioritization meeting, but this is, we call this uh, the show and tell. And the show and tell is where you're showing working code to the customer every week, to the product owner. So you're making sure that you are building the right things. Um, when I talked about acceptance criteria earlier, that's usually what we're using to show. So if, um, if there was a story about, you know, doing some kind of authentication, that's what I would show. I'd show logging into a, a particular site or something like that, or if it's, you know, insert story here, it would be just showing, 
showing the, the customer and then having them say, yes, you, you built exactly what we agreed to, or you know, we missed something. And if we miss something, then the next time we write stories, we try to make sure that we're incorporating enough stuff so that we're not missing pieces. Yeah, this is so we'll talk a little bit more uh, about putting this all together. So we're giving you kind of the pillars, and then there's a the process. How do you do all this stuff? Um, but this is one of those things where I was talking about before, where customer communication, right? Customer said, I want something, and then they find out after it's already done, the whole thing is already done, the entire system potentially, that it wasn't close. By doing, let's say, a one week iteration, you're working in small chunks, you've maybe just started working on a piece of functionality, you deliver that at the end of the week, the customer can see it, and all of a sudden they can make a decision on that piece of functionality. Is that what I've meant? Is there more there? Or as you've delivered units, right? So we maybe we play six stories and that creates a unit of work. Well, I had this grand plan to build this great module for this thing. But now this, what you show me, that actually is kind of what I meant. That, that maybe is pretty close. I can now decide to move us on to the next piece of work and maybe cut scope on my own, maybe add in something else that is more important. But you get this kind of continuous learning by showing the customer and getting them to give you feedback on a regular basis in short cycles, immediate feedback. Um, it allows us to course and recourse and course and recourse, course correct along the way. Right, so that's a good example. I gave the Army example earlier where um, I built an app and the buttons on the app were too small and when the soldiers put their gloves on, they, they're like, yeah, this isn't gonna work. So we were able to course correct in that way, but the way that Andy just described is actually positive too, right? It's like they've seen something and now they think, well, because this is doing this, maybe I don't need this or this or this. So you can sometimes eliminate scope as well. Um, there's like the 80-20 rule, like people spend 80% of their time and 20% of the code, right? So if we just build the 20%, <laughs> right, then we save quite a lot. And the show and tell is one place where we can do that. So pillar number four, continuous improvement. Um, as we talked about with our numbering series, you know, changing that, um, we've changed dozens of things just since we've been, you know, I've been here a year and he's been here six months. As we try things and they don't work, we change them and that's okay. And that's why we have these different touch points and that's why we have teams because the team can very easily say, you know what, um, having the scrum at nine o'clock isn't working for me, you know, it'd be better if we did it earlier and then, you know, have everyone agree. Um, there's, there's lots of important um, piece, pieces to that. So along those lines, there's another, uh, another piece that helps us um, with our continuous improvement, and that's what we call a retrospective. And again, I lump these in with the planning and prioritization. We do, I do them at the beginning of the planning and prioritization. We do uh, basically just a, a short recap of how the sprint went, what things went well, what things didn't go so well, and you know, then we usually talk about, you know, is there an experiment we want to try to do something differently in the next sprint, or what should we do differently? Um, it's a really, this is one of the most critical things in my <coughs> mind to help us continuously improve. Um, yeah, the, they don't have to be super long, but um, making making things visible. I just did one this week with my team. Andy had a great suggestion about having different people run the retrospective part every week. So we did that for the first time this last week and it worked out great. So we had someone from the team just walked up to a whiteboard, put the three columns, you know, what went well, what didn't go so well, what do we want to do differently? He stood up there, he took notes based on what the team was saying, went well, didn't go so well, and we want to try. And it's a big whiteboard that's just sitting there in our team space for us to look at throughout the iteration and say, yeah, yeah, this didn't work, let's, let's not do that. Or we all agree we're going to continue to do this. So um, a very, important part of, of making Agile work and continually improving. Yep, yeah, so for us, um, we kept having our uh, uh, dev complete column turn red. Uh, we were piling up stories that were complete, and you want to have a healthy system says, it's, it's, it's very much like manufacturing. If I can move something from one step to the other, that's my most efficient process, right? So immediate movement and immediate completion of work, because that means there's no delay in work getting to completion. Um, and so we, what we would have is we would have uh, developers finishing work, getting to dev complete, and then nobody would pick it up for QA. And in this case, it was because one person was responsible for doing QA. And he was also busy making sure that work was ready for the team to pick up, and so these things would sit and sit and sit and sit. The problem is, when something fails QA, 
and it goes back to a developer and it's been a week since they've touched it, it's just like switching context on projects. What did I do here? They might even look at, a developer, and uh, I wrote code so I can say this, might even look at something a week later and say, I don't even know why, why I wrote it this way. In order to fix this problem, I have to completely rewrite it. That's a really high cost delay. And so the shorter that you can make things, uh, the, the shorter the time frame that you can use to move things back in your system, the better off they are. And so what we did in the retrospective is, uh, finally after a couple weeks of having it up there, uh, when we got to not so well, um, I said, you know, our, our, we have a bottleneck in our QA complete home. It's creating a problem for us. Nothing changed in that week, um, even though we said we were going to we were going to pair on QA. So the person who was responsible for QA was going to teach somebody else how to do it, and then uh, that would happen for some period of time until that person then would, was uh, what he considered capable of doing it, and then they could each then go and pair with another set of developers. So now all of a sudden we can distribute QA. That didn't happen in that week. And so what happened is we brought it up again the next week. And what, what we've actually seen now is there was a response to that, a reaction. Something happened. They changed, and they started to actually do QA. Um, and it's because we talked about it. Uh, a lot of times if you, if you leave something and you don't talk about it, um, then uh, nothing changes. The other really interesting thing that I've noticed now is other people in the retrospectives on the team, so I'm the process person, right? I'm the scrum master, PM, whatever you want to call it. I'm the agile person on the team. That's why I'm on the team. Um, other people now are bringing up went well or not so well about the process itself, as opposed to it always being me looking at the process. Why? Because I'm communicating to the team how I look at the process, and so now they're starting to, okay, how does a PM think? Oh, okay, I, I, I see a little bit about how a PM thinks, and so they can start to see the process. And so now I don't have as much ownership. For me, as someone who's only been here for six months, when the team talks in the retrospective or in planning and prioritization are all these different touch points, communications, uh, ways to reflect, inspect, and adapt, um, I start to learn a little bit more about the system that they work in. And so, again, what, what we do is, as a result, we bring up the, the level of the entire team by doing these kinds of practices. Right. For, for us, uh, a couple of sprints ago, there was we noticed that people had too much work in process, progress. And um, I said to a couple people, I said, okay, why don't we do this? Why don't we do as an experiment? You just work on one thing at a time and see how it goes. And so for the last three or four sprints, I've been asking the same people, so how is it going for you? And they're like, oh, yeah, it's still going good. You're right. You know? So they're getting more done. They're feeling better. But if we hadn't talked about it in the retrospective, it might not have happened. Now, other things get discussed in the retrospective, too. Like one of our guys said, you know what I'm finding really handy? It's easier for me to log my time if I have an extra tab open, and this is how I do this, and I do this query. And, and so the rest of the team listens to that and goes, oh, you know what? That's a really good idea. You know, If I do that, maybe it'll make it easier for me to log time, too. So it's just, it's just another touch point for the team to get together and share ideas and, and try to So yeah, so basically all this to say that we need to adapt, we need to make changes as we need to make changes, right? Is not going to do us any good staying the course probably at that point? Um, so it's just, just continually look at your situation and think about, you know, are there things that we could do better? Can we improve, um, you know, the happiness of the team in some way? Is there stuff we can do to improve throughput, to get more to the steady state kind of um, feeling? So the ecosystem, so what are we really talking about in practice here? So what we're doing is we're doing kind of a, a, a version of Scrum. Scrum is a method, a framework, sorry, get methodologies, philosophies, and frameworks confused these days. Um, but basically you can download, there's a guide that says, you know, if you're using Scrum, you're doing this, 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 this. Um, Again, we're not agilistas. We know that there's a framework, and we leverage the good out of it, but we also infuse some of our own experience and tools that we picked up over time. Uh, but basically, what we do is we have a product backlog. We list as many stories as we have of 
you know, for, for the particular project or product. Um, then we pull them into the sprint backlog, which is the amount of work we want to do for that week. We, it says two to four weeks, we do one week um, in ours. Um, we do the daily scrum meeting, and then theoretically, um, by the end of each iteration, you have something that could be shippable, right? Now, again, sometimes there's ramp up time before you can get to that, but if you think about a website, maybe you could deliver it with just the about us and the you know homepage, right? And then as you start adding content, you just iterate and you can continue to deliver. One of the things that happens in a lot of software and other projects is you get to the end of the project, and because it was this big bank and you were expecting to deliver at the end, you don't have anything, right? And so we really want to take what we call thin slices of, of the project and be able to deliver them as as we go. There's a couple of things here that are really uh, valuable. So the first thing that I would say is if you don't have any practice in um, agile process, following a framework like Scrum can be really, really valuable. Because one of the things um, that can be really difficult the first time that you do something like this is deciding what you should or shouldn't do and why you should or shouldn't do those things. Um, you know, it's just like uh, my son trying to learn how to hit a ball out of the air for the first time as opposed to on a tee. Um, I could teach him that he needs to take a step when he needs to take a step. He needs to turn his hips first, then he needs to bring his hands through, then flip his wrist because that's where he'll get the most bat velocity. I'm going to confuse the heck out of a six-year-old trying to get him to hit the ball like a major leaguer. All I really want him to do is swing the bat and hit the ball, right? And so I want to get him started on the basics. And so I don't, I don't allow him to change those things. I don't try and teach him how to change those things. Um, and I'll give you an example. So the first time that I ever ran into Agile Software Development uh, was uh, when I came in contact with Mental Innovations. I, maybe most people know about Mental Innovations. Maybe you don't. Mental Innovations is based here in Ann Arbor. Their Agile methodology is uh, based off of extreme programming. If you picked up and read the extreme programming book, and then you walked into Mental Innovations, you would feel like you just stepped into the pages of the book. They follow it very, very, very closely. A great organization. Um, I then uh, took what I learned from Menlo Innovations and went back to the company I was working at at the time, and I said, this is the right way to deliver software. And I would say we had, I don't know, 30, 40% success in practice, and 60 to 70% failure in practice. Because ultimately, their practices were designed, and they were actually modified to fit their context, and I didn't understand that. And so had I gone to the extreme programming book and said, okay, this are, these are the things we're gonna try, we're gonna try them long enough so that we can learn from them in an informed way and make a decision, we may have had some greater success. Now the benefit that I had then was I knew what not to do, and so then when I went somewhere else and helped them adopt Agile practices, um, I had a little bit more flexibility. But the key thing there is I'm not gonna send a six-year-old to go teach other six-year-olds how to hit, I'm gonna have somebody who understands the concepts of hitting and have them teach them. Get some practice. When you do your first retrospective, don't talk about what you wanna change in your process. Stick with the process. Give it some time. Try it out. See what works and what doesn't. What you're gonna change is potentially stuff about the work that you do. Um, hey, we found that if we apply you know, the first person available, picks up a story to do QA on it because we don't have dedicated QA people. That's something that you want to inspect and adapt and improve. The, the key thing here is this framework works to a certain extent. Adapted, it works really well, but it works. So try it out and give it some time. Because ultimately what you see happen when you go some places where people say that they're agile, they've taken some elements of it. Uh, there's cards on the wall, the work is visible. They maybe stand up and talk to each other every morning. But ultimately, you have one person who does all this work, you have another person who does all that work, and you have another person who does all that work. That's not really agile, so to speak. Um, and so what you really want to do is you want to try something or have somebody who can help you, who understands and has done it before, uh, adapt this thing. But the Scrum Framework is a really useful guide. Scrum.org is a really useful guide uh, for putting something in practice that gets you there, try it for a while and then learn about it. Uh, my team actually practices what I would call Scrumbot. Um, so there's another process called Kanban that's based on Lean. Um, and there are some really great things that happen in Kanban that I like a lot. There are some really great things that happen in Scrum. And so after having practiced some kind of extreme programming that we won't really acknowledge as extreme programming because it wasn't really close, 
having practiced some scrum and then I worked on a Kanban team for a while, I've actually taken those practices and molded them together. And you know what happens? Uh, Mark, who I don't think has worked on a Kanban team before, gives me feedback on things that my team could be doing from his experience, and I benefit from those things. And so there's there's this, this thing that can happen once you get some experience or get some people with experience in different agile methodologies that help you make your team better. But this is a great place to start because this puts all the pieces together of everything that we've talked about. So it's something to look at. Kanban is another, stream programming is a third. The, the beautiful thing about this one is it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple. Um, the details, you know, devil's in the details. It's like a seven page document and it outlines the entire process. It's, it's not too bad. It's, um, but like Andy said, the best way to adopt it is to have someone who's been through it before to kind of to guide you. All right, so in practice, th there's a fantastic video that I'll share with all of you that it's like eight minutes long or something like that, and it takes you through everything that we talked about in the half. Not really, but it, it is eight minutes long, and it tell, it, it's got a picture very similar to this. And basically, this is kind of how our work flows. Um, stories come in to a team. Sometimes they're bugs or enhancements. Sometimes they're project stories. They come into this kind of funnel. Our team is represented here. We do the work. We uh, crank the work out this end. Um, the product owner gets to see that. We communicate with the stakeholders. They get together and talk about new stories and new things that need to happen. And it fills the funnel again. So we get this nice cycle of work coming in and the team cranking stuff out. Um, over time, my team has figured out about how much <laughs> their mix of support slash maintenance stuff is versus the amount of project stuff. Um, it's something that you can track. Not all teams track it. Um, we're actually more in the 90-something on project work now. Um, when I started, it wasn't like that. It was, the, it was kind of the other way around. Andy's got an opposite problem where he's got more of his work as maintenance and support, um, and a small portion of it is um, actual project work. But this is kind of the idea. Stuff fills this pipeline, team churns it out, meetings happen, discuss the next things, and it just keeps cycling. Anything to add there? No. Oh, no. Well, I did have a question that was in my head, which was, um, how many projects can a process owner manage? Is that also a one-to-one? -one? So, you mean product owner? Like, uh, project manager, whatever. A project the manager. Is. So the question is, how many projects can a project manager run? Um, what I like to see is a one, ideally, right? Because they're on a team, right? And they're, they're working anything that they can work to help the team out throughout, throughout the project. So they're writing stories, they're, they're doing, you know, planning the retrospectives, they're setting up whatever else needs to, to happen. And in the case of one that I'm, I'm, another team I'm helping out this week, there's stuff where we need to do some work with MCIT, coordination, things like that. So I'll be handling that. Whatever barriers I can remove from people on the team, I consider my job. I'm, I'm like the wolf in Pulp Fiction, right? There's a problem, I gotta solve it, right? I gotta figure out a way, a way around it. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we, again, uh, so uh, traditionally what tends to happen is people look at things in terms of work. We tend to look at things in terms of team. The, the working unit and having a healthy working unit is the most important thing that you can have. Now that, that team is gonna do work, but that team is also gonna identify their work and they're gonna manage their work and they're gonna be uh, effective at doing those things if you let the team handle that stuff. Um, and we would say that a, a healthy team is a cross-functional team that includes a, 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 a project manager, scrum master, process coach. That's and so typically it's typically a rate limiter then. I mean, if you have three project managers, you can only have three active teams. Uh, again, it, it depends. <laughs> okay. So, so I would say ideally, yes. Okay. Um, now, of course, organizations are constrained. Um, one of the organizations that I worked at as a, a, a delivery leader uh, in that organization, I, I for a time had one team, um, and uh, really enjoyed myself. Uh, because I was a part of the team, I was always there, I was a part of delivering what that team was responsible for. Uh, we lost somebody, um, actually we picked up some new work, they combined departments and brought in some uh, new developers, and so that delivery lead went over with that team, and I picked up his team. Uh, it was really hard to feel like I was plugged into either team really well, because they sit in two different team spaces, and they're responsible for two wholly different product lines, and so now it became more a matter of me uh, looking almost as an outsider at the work going through the system as opposed to being an integrated member of the team understanding 
how the team is working day in and day out, what their bottlenecks are, um, because I'm context switching all the time, and so there is a cost to that. Uh, now, I did it anyways because that was the need, um, and we made it work. Uh, but uh, ideally, a healthier system is uh, to have a cross-functional, dedicated team, and that team is dedicated to some work that they're responsible for. All right, so an another example, this team I'm helping out for two weeks. So um, one of our PMs is on vacation for two weeks, so I'm helping this team out. And they, it's one team, it's a very, very, very small team. It's too few to really be considered a team, but it's getting bigger. Um, but, it's <laughs> funny. Turn that off. Uh, the, uh, the thing with night total loss, my <laughs> sure, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, so um, this particular team has three real projects that they're working on at any one time. But as these colors are kind of supposed to denote, we, we organize them by project. So, and the other piece of this is we brand the teams too. So that team is called Iron Shrimp, just happens to be the name that they pick. But um, what we do is we organize these teams, uh, or organize the work that comes in by project. So they're working on something, a psych inpatient check application. So they, they pull all those stories together and for a burst, that's all they're gonna work on. And then they're doing this orange card thing, so they're gonna burst that stuff too. So they serialize this stuff as much as possible uh, to help with the, you know, minimize the context switching and stuff. But it's still just 1 p.m. One team, it just so happens they have several projects. Now, on top of that, there's about five or six projects that they're in charge of support and maintenance for. So as those stories come in, it's a discussion that the PM has with all the product owners. So you figure three, three projects they're working on, a product owner for each one, and then you know the five support projects they're working on, technically a project, product owner for each one of these. So as these things come in, there's some coordination work for the PM to do. Talk to people and talk about what are really the requirements here? What is what is the priority of these things? Are these you know sub one or sub zero kind of things where it's like something's absolutely broken and it can't stand another day without being fixed, or is this something that we can plan in a sprint so that we can get it with a bunch of other stories with that project? So I know we've been uh, at asking questions as we go, but I think we wanna we've got like seven minutes left, and we want to be able to hear your reactions or questions to the presentation. So. Um, We'll, we'll kind of wrap up with this, which is if we revisit that project that we talked about, using traditional um, project management methodologies, if you remember, we delivered week 10, and we realized break even at week 15. Now all of a sudden, so, so details being the same, but now all of a sudden we can work in short iterations. At week five, the owner of this product can actually decide, I have enough here that I can take to market, and I can start to sell this thing, not only can I start to sell it, but in that time frame, I realize a $100,000 payback on my million dollar investment. So by week 10, I've already started on my way to break even. Starting at week 10, I can actually increase that to $200,000 because my team is still doing work. We're not done, we've just released to market here. We've continued, we've continued. Now we release to market here because this is my next most viable release. Well, we, we borrow here um, from the concept of Lean Startup. It's a great book by Eric Reese um, called Minimum Viable Product. What can the customer actually use um, that will help, help them start to do what they need from the system? So here we've had Minimum Viable, viable Product. Now we've got our second release. Um, and by our third release, we've actually realized 300000 in that million dollar payback. The other thing is, at some point in time, like we talked about earlier, the product owner can actually say, done. So they might get um, you know, 700,000, 800,000 in the spend and realize that they're done. Um, and so what you can see is not only does it change the way in which we interact as a team, the way in which we interact with our customers. Um, now I know here a lot of times it's internal customers, um, so it's a little bit different, but conceptually this stuff all works for even those. Um, but we can actually even start to change the way in which we deliver value to our organization because we're we're learning, we're delivering, we're shortening our feedback cycles, um, we're making mistakes and learning from those, and, um, and, and creating good products. Right, and the other, the other thing is, in the commercial world, first to market is huge, right? So just by being the first one out there with something, um, if you think about, do you remember when Gmail started, right? It was a pretty 
slim. I didn't do very many things, but they built over it over time. And I mean, no one can really touch it right now. Google's got got the market corner. You had a question? Uh, well, I have a comment, I guess, in response to this slide in particular. So we typically don't have this option because we do research projects who are not commercial. And so every participant who in, is in, enrolled in our studies needs to have exactly the same experience. So we have yeah. to be pretty much ready day one. So the risk that we're worried about is if we intensify our timelines for products, say we have nine months because the project launches in time with the school year. So, you know, first day of the semester, the project has to launch or whatever. We've got from January to September, and we say, well, we're only going to, we're going to, you know, intensify it so that we, we work on it January, February, March. We're done in March. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing we're all worried about is that the client has from March to September to rethink and say, oh, well, you know, I worked on this thing, and, you know, Michigan Department of Community Health has changed such and such regulation, and such and such school dropped out, and... You know, I read this paper on this great new finding that, you know, if you use the word energy instead of this, that, or the other, it's much more effective. Blah, 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 right? There's thousands of examples we could give you. So now there's six months where this thing is sitting there, either gathering dust or being used or tested or piloted, and we now don't have any more time to change or money to change because we've gone on to the next project or the next project. So that's one of the things that we worry about. I guess it's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, I, I can totally understand that. So it's, it's, it's a matter of um, obviously making some decisions at that point, right? So um, the first thing I would say is uh, you, uh, if you've given yourself that kind of window, right, where you actually have six months before it has to be delivered, then hopefully your next project that you're working on, you have that same window and you can actually make a critical decision at that point in time. Now, if money's gone, that's an easy answer. Uh, that's a really easy answer. I'm sorry we can't make that change. <laughs> we spent it. It seems like an easy answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure, yeah. Easy. Some of it is setting expectations with the product owner and the customers ahead of time too, right? So that they know, look, do you want working, well designed, you know, great stuff that's going to work for you, or do you want to string this thing along, waste our time? You know, it's like there's lots of lots of bits. So you would reap other rewards here. I'm sure you're not going to get the you know, the payback or whatever because you have a, a release date. So here's another one for you. Um, I worked on a product where the product owner delivered software over a nine month period of time. In the next fiscal year was given a $100,000 budget to maintain that piece of software. So you deliver something to market, even if you deliver early and start learning, you still might learn something from a customer from your market at this point in time. Um, and so in the next fiscal year, she was given another $100,000 in budget. And but she had a year, right? It's, it's the budget for the year, this is how much money you're going to get on this project. And she had some immediate enhancements we wanted to make, as she wanted to make. And so what we agreed upon was you could spend 50% to 75% of your budget in the first three months of the year if you want to, but what you have to do is you have to save 25% of it. Just in this example, so scale that however it makes sense. You have to save 25% of it because if we get to the last two months of the year and you find out you have a critical bug, we have to have budget to be able to fix that bug. And so maybe it would be to say, okay, we can only spend 90%. We're gonna, we're gonna work in this fashion, right? We can spend 90% of your budget building this, but we know these things happen in our environment. We know you're gonna come back to us and make a change. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna ask you to build a backlog of those changes. We're gonna get to the point where we have enough time to spend the rest of that budget, and then we're gonna ask you, let's prioritize these changes together. When they get ownership of that, and they don't do the last 30% of their changes, they don't necessarily blame you because they have to pick which 70% of changes they made or 20%, depending on if the first one is really big. But you have that budget, you have that time, and you have that backlog, and they can get some of those changes made. See how that goes, try it out, and then tweak it, and maybe do it different the next time. But that would be potentially one way to solve that problem. So I'll give you another example, because I've been on both sides. I've been a guy who's applied for grants and got them, and I've also been a guy who's received grants and approved or, or denied them. So with your example, if say it's, you know, you got a nine month window, you finish after a month, four or five, something like that, with something that works, when you're trying to get grants, one of the most powerful things is having something that works to show other people, right? So if you have working code after only a couple of weeks or a couple of months, um, you can apply for other grants and, and use it for other things. So 
we, we just got to think about framing these things in different ways, and, and we talk a lot about value. And so, you know, depending on the researcher and you know what, what's being worked on, there may be a way to increase the value because it's it's done sooner. That's a thought. I think we just had one more slide anyway. Yeah. Questions. Questions. <laughs> Other questions? Do you, you, do you and all of your staff log your time? So, uh, <laughs> so oh, you had to open that can of worm food before lunch, right? <laughs> so, so, in my experience, uh, because I work at places that do and do not track time, uh, time tracking is much like estimating how long something will take. I get to the end of my week. And I look back and I put my time in buckets and I estimate about how much time I spent doing the stuff that I spent. Uh, you're just as likely to take something like uh, story points, even though I really hate doing that, because story points are intended to help us plan and look forward. Um, but uh, tracking time is done almost as much as an estimate as story points are, so you're probably within a curve. Uh, the other thing is, if you think about it, if you're dedicated to a project, tracking time becomes much less important. Because what did you do this week? Right. I worked on this project. And if you can say, I spend, okay, so our cadence meetings take 10% of our time, the things that we do every week. So I'm 90% billable to a project. The only thing that you need to report on is vacations and time off. And we probably all do that anyways because we request it out of HR uh, so they can record it. So um, time tracking is usually a condition of the environment that we work in. Um, if we can start to change those environments, then we can start to uh, not have to track time. Um, if you have to bill, um, you might have to track time. Sometimes that's just the reality of the situation. We don't, but I was just wondering, you know, to get to that level of detail of saving 10% of, of the budget until a certain time, you know, I, I feel like we would need to track to get to that. Yeah, I think you need to say back story points or something. Estimates could be a big thing. You could do that. You could do story points too. You could figure it out based on that. Um, Amy's team is a recharge team, so they log in 15 minute increments. We've tried to make it as painless as possible. <laughs> yeah, the easiest you can make it if you have to do it uh, is, is the biggest thing. It's the biggest thing. But again, if you're dedicated, then you know what you're charging against the product. Uh, and that's that's uh, the environment that I worked in, even where we did track time. We were dedicated teams. And so I, I could be really predictive about when and how. It was really just that people were out that my, that my metrics changed. And, any other questions? Other questions? How do you handle the customer who, you know, you're, you've got so many teams and they're full, and the customer says, well, when's my stuff going to get worked on? Or, you know, how, do, you, do you let them know, you know, you're in the queue for September or whatever, or you maintain some kind of fiction that, oh, we're working on it? So the fiction <laughs> thing never really ends well. <laughs> so I found with, with my customers, they just want to know the truth, and they want to know what's going on. And if we're free with giving them that, you know, and we're honest about it, it tends to work out better than, I mean, we have some customers that we've been stringing along for a while, and they're getting angry, and so one of the things, being a recharge unit, that's something that we're, we're always juggling, right? We don't want to lose business, but the best way to lose business is to tick off a customer, right? Then they go somewhere else and they say, don't go to this group. So we want to be open and honest with them. It's better for us to say, look, we can't get to you until July. And then have them go somewhere else, but not hate us. Then string them along, have them hate us, and for sure never come back. So I try to just be honest and transparent with, with customers as much as possible. But again, if we're doing one project at a time, I can be completely predictive. I can tell you that the Psych Check app is done June first. I can tell you that because of our velocity. I can tell you that because it's more detail than we need to go in right now. But we. We can figure out based on our velocity that we'll either get to this story or we'll get to this story. So some of the somewhere in here is what we're going to finish. Probably not down here, and we'll definitely get more than this. So a lot of customers, that's good enough. And because they're always prioritizing their highest value stuff at the top, we're guaranteed to get the highest value stuff done. So yeah. that's it's it's interesting that we pretend like we have capacity where we don't. Um, and so no can be uh, an ally to us. I, saying I can't take on work feels really really wrong for some strange reason, but the reality is, if we say yes, to Mark's point, we actually risk uh, offending or hurting a customer that we've already committed to because we don't have capacity to do both things effectively and on time. We're gonna slow down on something. So if we've already committed to a date, um, or what we then end up doing is we end up 
backing all our work up all the way to a year and spreading it out longer than it needs to be and making our timelines longer to accommodate these things. And we, we cut on quality, we cut on team satisfaction, which is a really important thing that we haven't even touched on. Happy people are effective people. Um, we end up hurting ourselves in a lot uh, of other ways when we don't willingly turn away work. We want to be really good at the things we do accept, and that's why we work in this way, by focusing on one thing and having a whole healthy team. Um, one of the things I do want to be cognizant of is, one, you might have more questions or might be more interested in things. The other is that we've already gone a little bit over. We did start a little bit late, so hopefully uh, you won't blame us for that. But uh, the blinking laptop, we'll blame it on the blinking laptop. The one thing, you're welcome to stay and ask some more questions. If you do choose to leave, totally fine. Um, I would just ask you, on the back we have um, something that gives us feedback on what you thought of the presentation today. Um, Sunshine means it was great. It was uh, like uh, Saturday was. It was 70 some odd degrees and beautiful all day long and you look uh, the hour and a half um, all the way down to rainy. Um, if you have some specific comment you want to make, please make that comment. If you just want to put a check and stick it next to the thing that you feel about the presentation, uh, you're welcome to do that also. The stickies are on the back table there with some Sharpies. Um, so on your way out, if you could do that for us, that would really help us. Um, get a sense and, and do this continuous improvement feedback cycle thing with how we do our presentations as well. I'll just let you know one other thing that our team has been doing for the last several weeks is um, on Thursdays from 2 to 3 o'clock we have something called Agile Coffee over in the collab space in building 200. It's just a long table kind of like this. We all just sit down and if people have topics they throw them out and we just talk about them. So for an hour Come bring a cup of coffee and hang out with us and just chat. Sometimes there's this many people, sometimes there's Andy and I talking, so, you know, it's just, you just never know. But if there are topics, questions, things like that, that's a really great forum um, to just hang out with some people that are doing the transformation too. Um, otherwise, um, it's pretty easy to find us, BG and um, Mike, sorry, and Holly. No, uh, <laughs> we have our email addresses, so you know, feel free to contact us. All right, thanks again, everybody. Can you come back for a little QA session? Yeah, well, you, you, if you have more, if you want. Yeah. Well, yeah, we do, but I have to go run a meeting that will probably be totally ineffective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know what? Just schedule something with us. We'd be happy to come right. by. Absolutely. Um, right, we'll have BG or Holly. Yeah. Or Bill. You can say it. Or Kathy. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> I mean, people have maybe more questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm, sure. I'm good. By all means. Okay. Uh, one question I had was, what is your space physically?